to the center. Arsenal one nil up. He's got open goal. Oh no, he's missed. When I was a player at Arsenal, I could never envisage managing the club. Uh, but to actually manage them now, uh, win a trophy my first year, win the championship my third year, it's like a fairy tale. Well, it's nice to look back over almost 40 years uh, of football, both as a player, coach and a manager, uh, looking at the good times and also some bad times, and hopefully, I'm sure, looking, uh, looking ahead to more good times in the future. I was born in a small village uh, called Bergeri, just about seven miles outside Glasgow. Uh, came from a very, very working class background. Uh, my father died when I was a couple of weeks old, so there were six of us left, uh, three brothers and two sisters, uh, me being the youngest and obviously being very, very spoiled. Uh, all, all my brothers were all footballing people. Uh, so I really learned all my basic techniques at a very early age uh, in the streets. Uh, I can remember, even at the age of five years of age, there wasn't too many cars around. And uh, so the streets were nice and quiet. So actually we learned all our ball skills in the summer, uh, obviously nice light evenings, but also in the winter. And uh, the, the lights used to come on to light up the streets. And that's where I first uh, performed in the floodlights. Uh, later on in life, when people ask you to sort of control a ball or uh, juggle with a ball. It all goes back to the days on the streets in Bargeri, under those famous floodlights, paid by the council. But my eldest brother Andy, was the, he was a mainstay in the family. Uh, he was the father figure for everybody. From a very early age, we realised that George was something really special. So I decided then that it was start the scrapbook, compile a scrapbook, right from his beardless and junior secondary days. Uh, right through his whole career, the scrapbook covers everything from he played from the school days, right through his amateur international days, his schoolboys international days, under 21 for Scotland, under 23 for Scotland, right through for international cap. It's all in his scrapbook here. Well, obviously, playing for the, the Scottish schoolboys, uh, you got all the top clubs in Scotland and England, obviously, want to sign for them. Andy actually was of the opinion that I'd be better coming down south where they had uh, an apprenticeship. They had a youth policy uh, in all the major clubs in England. Joe Mercer, was, uh, he made a big impression uh, on my family, my mother and uh, my eldest brother. And I went down there a couple of times uh, and I liked the set up, the set up at uh, Aston Villa because they were one of the biggest clubs around at that time. Uh, so I finally made my, my decision and it was going to be Aston Villa. I think when you're that age, 15, 16, and you leave home to go and live in another part of the, the country, it is very, very difficult. Because when you're an outstanding schoolboy, and then you go and join somebody like Villa, you're normally the best at your school and one of the best in the schoolboy team. And obviously joining Villa, there's other outstanding kids there. So you come back down the earth with a bump again. My next natural progression there was I, got, I actually made my debut uh, against Liverpool, uh, the famous Liverpool. Uh, they were champions then. Uh, with Ian St John and Ron Yates on the side. And I managed to score in my debut, which was, uh, you know, which is a, another memory that I've got in my scrapbook here. Being there four years, it never really actually uh, turned out uh, as well as uh, my debut. And uh, luckily, I, I was uh, in my, my stay at Villa, I was actually selected for the Scottish youth team. Uh, funnily enough, uh, I had a very good time playing for Scotland uh, in the youth. Uh, team, and, uh, but not very well at Villa Park. And uh, Ted Bates, who was then the manager of Southampton, asked me to come through and uh, see the Dell and see the surrounding place as he wanted to sign me. Uh, and looking back now, it's quite funny, I was on about £18 a week at uh, Aston Villa. And after having a long chat with Ted, and Ted tried to sell me the club, uh, he offered me £25 a week. So being a typical Scot, I thought, well, I'll hold out for 30, and I asked Ted for 30. Uh, and he says, no, I don't think so, 25 is as far as I would go. So I, I, I said to him, I'd let him know the following day, after having to think about it, whether I'd turn down his offer or not. Knowing full well I'd accept the offer, because it was the only one I had on the table. That evening I got home, there was a message from Tommy Doherty, 
who was then the manager of Chelsea, so I rang Tommy and uh, he actually said to me, what have you been offered by Southampton? And I says, well, Ted Bates has offered me 25. He says, well, what are you looking for? And I says, 30. He says, okay, you've got it. Joining Chelsea, uh, swinging Chelsea, uh, it was two tremendous years, the start of two tremendous years, joining a very young and exciting team. And there was Venables, uh, Johnny Holland, Ronnie Harris, myself, and obviously being a single guy, uh, living in the Chelsea, uh, Fulham, Ellis Court area in the swinging 60s, uh, it was a very enjoyable time off the pitch as well. It's, I can see it now. He walked round, when he'd been signed, he walked round into the office in his silver shiny suit, immaculate, looked like, we used to call him Big Fry, he always used to look like the guy that was carrying, he always used to come in, he always used to be that sort of grin, sort of coming, hi there, how are you, you know, uh, deep voice, but he was always immaculate, immaculately dressed, that's how, I can always, that's how I can remember, I think, crumbs, he must be a model, we've signed a model. Straight away George came in and he looked as if he'd just come out of Burton's shop, shop window, you know, he looked, always looked suave and debonair and we all sort of struggled to look fairly smart and George was just always looked apart and uh, he was like the Cary Grant of the, of the troupe but he always did everything in style and he loved his Frank Sinatra records and, and he was, he, he, was he was a very stylish guy then. George and Terry decided well I wonder if it'd be an idea if we started our own suits and our own tailoring so they got a, a tailor who they knew very well I bought a I bought one suit uh, wasn't too pleased with it, but I didn't didn't want to knock their confidence. But they they tried selling the suits to the boys, and uh, they used to wear them themselves. We had pictures taken in all the all the wild stuff. I had a silly hat on, I think, and a check jacket. And George was as always like James Bond in the uh, evening suit. Terry with a I think it was a collarless jacket. Uh, I can't remember what the other guys had, but from there I think they, they wouldn't say it was one of their most uh, profitable ventures, business ventures, not as successful as they are now. Being the youngest, uh, obviously, you're getting the hand-downs from your older brothers, uh, school blazer. Uh, we start off with my eldest brother Andy, then got to my other brother Tom, then Robert, and I'd finish up, and by the time I got it, it was full of patches on the elbows. Uh, Restitching uh, the pockets, and obviously that is probably why one of my hobbies today is uh, clothes. I like wearing nice clothes, uh, and I insist at the club that all the players are always uh, smartly turned out uh, with the club uniform, well dressed on the pitch as well as off the pitch. As a player, uh, very dangerous in and around the box for anything put into the penalty box for crosses and things. Great first touch. <laughs> He'll laugh if I say he's got blistering pace. No, he hasn't got that. That's why they got the nickname of Stroller. But uh, intelligent and knew where to be at the right time. I think as a player, when he was at Chelsea, he played as a, as a striker, played as a centre forward. And um, he always was a good, what we'd call a target man, where you could hit the ball to him at any angle. He controlled it well. He was very good in the air. He lacked a bit of pace um, to be perhaps a very top striker. I still use George now as a, a model if I'm sort of coaching heading as to how to hang in the air. He, he was one of these players who uh, had the ability to jump and stay up, apparently stay. Uh, unfortunately we lost in two FA Cup semi-finals, one to Liverpool, one to Sheffield Wednesday. We were going very well uh, at the time in the league and uh, with two games in the north of England, uh, one of them obviously against Blackpool I think the other one, if my memory serves me right, it was against Burnley. Uh, we stayed at Blackpool for over a week and uh, Tommy asked us uh, on a Wednesday evening uh, if we could actually come back. There was a curfew on, I think, 11 o'clock. Well, some of us thought that was a bit harsh. Blackpool being uh, a nice seaside, very friendly place, uh, lots of activity going on. We thought actually that was a bit harsh. We thought the Thursday night would be a good night for a curfew. So we went back to the hotel and sneaked down uh, the fire escape and uh, went out and enjoyed ourselves. And when we got back, uh, after, well after the curfew, Tommy was waiting for us with the tickets back to London the next day. He was right. We realised we were wrong. Uh, looking back on it now, it seems very funny. 
but uh, there was quite a few managers involved with the players that were sent back, or future managers. Blackpool night out, is that, that's what the headline said in all the newspapers, Blackpool, yes. It was, uh, it was innocent fun, really, but uh, possibly that was one of the reasons, um, in the end, that Tommy did break the team up, that he thought, well, perhaps they've, they've grown up to be men now, and perhaps I can't discipline them as much as I'd like to. Uh, and from there on in, I think it was downhill. I asked for a transfer mainly because I thought the, the team was being uh, broken up and the, all the best players were leaving. Uh, and the other reason re uh, was because Dave Sexton by that time had, had uh, left Chelsea and was now working and coaching at Arsenal. And I had a great respect for Dave as a coach. Uh, and I worked very well with him. And uh, when I thought there was a, a, a chance of actually joining Arsenal, uh, I was very interested. And uh, that's exactly what happened. He was extremely suitable for the Arsenal at that time because um, he was very stylish. You know, they liked, they liked goal scorers, but they liked to see a bit of football as well. You know. And uh, George fitted all the requirements. He was stylish, he could play football, he could score goals, he could lead the line. You know, he had a good temperament and uh, really was an ideal first buy for Bertie and, and for Arsenal. Joining Arsenal uh, it really surprised me. It took me at least a couple of years uh, to sort of fall in with their professionalism, uh, the way they did things. Uh, Bertie was a, a tremendous stickler for uh, organisation, discipline. Uh, and looking back now, he was 100% right. Well, he fulfilled um, all that I was uh, looking for, as events proved. Uh, he was an invaluable member of our, our double team. Uh, his abilities on, on the field, unfortunately, get tended to give people the wrong impression, hence his nickname Stroller, that there was a certain air of casualness about him. Uh, and whilst that was very, very appropriate, at times it was a little frustrating, and one had to motivate George on a, on a stick and carrot uh, routine uh, at various every summer eight games. In other words, we had to threaten, threaten him with coming out of the side and kicking his backside if he didn't put himself about. And that seemed to uh, do the trick all right. And he had a, a very successful and very long career uh, as a result of that. Like all footballers, there were pluses and minuses about George as a player. The minuses really were that his fitness level wasn't terribly great. I mean, he wasn't a, a quick man. He was a tall man for a start, which didn't, he wasn't a natural sprinter. He had an elegant style, and a style which became obviously the nickname Stroller, affectionately known as Stroller. But within a team, you needed other players around him to do probably quicker things. But he was a thinking footballer. His greatest attribute was his heading ability and he scored vital goals for us. He scored goals in great cup games, he scored goals in normal league games. But it was the way he scored them. He had a style about him, and his heading ability in particular. He had the timing which was perfect to actually meet the ball, and then the direction. I mean, I think back to something, say, like the semi-final goal against Stoke in 71. And I would say if you had to have a, a coaching film, you would just take a clip of George Graham when he rose to meet the cross, and then directed it beyond the greatest goalkeeper in the game at that time, Gordon Banks. And although people say they called him Stroller and that was his nickname... And... Being a cat for Scotland is, you know, it's something that every Scots footballer, it's their ambition. And uh, it was a big occasion for me to uh, get my first cap at Hamden. I think it was against Portugal. Uh, very excited about it. And, uh, I had tremendous memories. I remember uh, Tommy Doherty took us to a tournament in Brazil, and we were, uh, it was a mini World Cup, and uh, we were uh, paired off with Brazil uh, in the Maracanã Stadium, which we just lost in the last 10 minutes, 1-0. Uh, then we had a tremendous game against um, Yugoslavia. Uh, we drew 2-2, and uh, I always remember Willie Morgan missing a penalty. We could have won that game. And then we drew against Czechoslovakia. But my international career, unfortunately, was very brief. Um, I'd like to have got a lot more caps, but uh, there was a lot of very, very good midfield players around. So looking back, probably I was lucky to get my 12 caps.
Uh, we got to one of those times where Bertie decided to leave George out and, and shake him up again, and uh, he put him on the subs bench, and we played in Coventry, and the game went on. And our left half, our left midfield player, David Cord, got injured. And like we looked along the bench, and, and George was a sub, and Bertie looked at me, and I looked at Bertie, and Bertie said, what do you think? I said, well, give him a go. So off we go, we shoved George on, and he played left half. And he virtually took the game by the scruff of the neck, and everybody was surprised. And like he was a huge and left off as a springboard to get forward. And when he got forward, he got forward free. And he could manage to get to the, to the far post. So it worked so well that the next match, Bertie put him at left off again. He had disguise in his passing. He could look that way and pass the ball this way. And obviously, he still had this ability to get to the far post and knock him in with his head. In the year 70, when we won the first cup, uh, that was a tremendous achievement and to be, uh, what was it, three down at Anderlecht and then to come back at home and win and we won something for the first time in, in our, our, what was it, 20, 30 years. So then we went on to the 70, 71 season with all that behind us, all that work that had been done and uh, I, in, in my heart of hearts, knowing that we had the nucleus of a side that for, for, could go from strength to strength. And indeed, the 70-71 season uh, saw the culmination of all those dreams in uh, win winning the double. Couldn't run, because everybody said, oh, well, George Graham, good player, but he can't run, he could. He won a fast runner, but he could keep getting up and down. And like I said, this, this left half thing had really got him going. We actually had to play, uh, we're all rival spurs at White Hart Lane. But we, we knew we only needed a draw to actually clinch a championship. We went over there and I thought we played a very, very sensible game. And instead of drawing, we actually scored in the last, I think it was five minutes. Great goal by Ray Kennedy. Uh, and tremendous scenes. Uh, and that was the all lead up uh, to the cup final on the following Saturday. And I always remember Don Howe, uh, after the, the Tottenham match, uh, saying that we've done the hard work. Because a championship is what all the professors want to win. That is, a, that, that is the thing to win, because uh, you're the most consistent over a season. Cups, you can win six or seven games and win a cup, but that doesn't make you the best team. Winning the championship makes you the best side. And then uh, our outstanding goalkeeper of the season made a big boob. Liverpool are winning 1-0. So, I mean, Bertie was super with me. He used to give me a lot of kind of license for freedom to, to, to work with the players and do tactical changes. And he used to let me go with it. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, we've got to do something here, like, I mean, we can't just let this thing fall away. And I knew the players kind of given it all they've got. So we decided to swap, I decided that uh, we'd swap them round. We swapped George Graham from left half up to centre forward. Pull Charlie George, who was really, uh, it was a very hot day and he'd gone. I mean, Charlie had just finished. Pull him back into left half, virtually just to stand in midfield. Anyway, we switched George up front, George Graham up front. And we're playing away, then all of a sudden there's a scrimmage in the goal mouth. And there's a lot of Liverpool players, and there's George Graham and Eddie Kelly. And uh, I think Frank McClintock was around. And all of a sudden, like, the ball's in between the legs. And of course, George turns around with his arm up in the air, like, I've got the goal. Then Eddie Kelly turns around with his arm up in the air, I've got the goal. Well, to us on the bench, we couldn't give a damn who got the goal. The most important thing was he got, got the goal. I still say now that actually the, the ball brushed my leg, and that's why I run away, uh, except in the plaudits. But Jimmy Hill has got a lot to answer for. He actually saw it from a different angle. Uh, but I can say now that I've seen it from a different angle that Jimmy's seen it and actually the ball did brush my leg. So it's now one each and I'm thinking to myself, well, it ain't our day. We can beat Liverpool, but it ain't going to be our day. Let's settle for a draw. Take them to a replay, which would either have been at Wembley or Sheffield Wednesday or somewhere like the following Wednesday. Because with the chances we made today, if we do it again on Wednesday, we'll score, we'll score four or five. So we switch them back. Having got the equaliser and made it one each, we switched them back. And there must be about then about, oh, I don't know, about eight minutes to go till the end of the game. And then all of a sudden, right out of the blue, the ball goes to Charlie George. And he hasn't played for the last kind of, I mean, extra time. He wouldn't even know what extra time was, Charlie. He's absolutely, and we'd used our subs, so we couldn't take Charlie off. We couldn't sub Charlie, Charlie George. Eddie Kelly had gone on for Peter Story, so our sub had gone. Uh... And also, he picks up a ball, Charlie George, and he hits this ball from about 20 yards, and it absolutely flies in. And if you see it on the telly, Charlie falls down. He scores this goal, he puts his hands in the air, 
and he finishes up on, on the floor on his back as though he celebrates. I tell you what, he was absolutely well and truly done in. You know, he done enough. And and at the end of the game, that that wins us the game. That, that and that obviously pinches the double. It was one of the highlights uh, of my career, uh, the Liverpool match. I did enjoy the big occasion. You know, Wembley. Yeah, I think that was probably the right occasion, being televised all over the world. And, uh, I like being on the ball, and I know at Wembley, there's a lot of space at Wembley. And uh, I think my teammates were good. They just kept giving me the ball. And it was a tremendous team effort, although I, I actually had a great satisfaction in winning the Man of the Match award, uh, which uh, holds pride of place in my, uh, my trophy room. And Bertie Mee more or less told me that a move away from the club would be in my, myself, in my best interest, and also the club's. Uh, the way it was handled was just typified, you know, what I believe Arsenal is. Bertie had agreed with three clubs, uh, West Ham, Everton and Manchester United, uh, 150,000 fee. So I actually saw all the managers and finally made my, my, my decision in joining uh, Tommy Doherty again uh, at Old Trafford. Leaving one great club, uh, Arsenal, to join another, Manchester United, uh, it was a dream move. For, for somebody who'd be no longer had a career at Arsenal. But unfortunately, my two years at Manchester was, uh, I would tell them, was a big failure because I couldn't reproduce uh, my Arsenal for him. He left Manchester United and uh, he went to Portsmouth. And although it was perhaps getting towards the twilight of his career, things didn't go too well for him there. And uh, I signed him at Crystal Palace to, to help the younger players. We was coming to a period of time where we could have got promotion from the third division. It was going to be tight, but um, but uh, I, we had a good chance. You know, George joined us, and he done particularly well. He done very well for us, and he was a good influence. And then he got injured. He got a few injuries. Um, we went out one day, and I just said, you know, but you're coming up to 32 now, 31. And he said, uh, yeah. I said, what are you going to do? So he said, well, I've not really thought about it. I said, I'm, I'm amazed. I can't believe that you're saying that because he's, he's an intelligent bloke, and. Uh, it's like a lot of footballers, they think the, the, that sort of age never comes, it's always in the future and, it, and something will happen and, uh, and he wasn't as prepared as I thought that he might have been and being as I hadn't really been in touch with him so much in the, those last few years, I wasn't sure what, what he was doing. But uh, he said he was interested in coaching, so I said, well, why don't you come and take the youth team? And of course he did do that and, uh, and he'd done very well. He took to it straight away and he was very keen, conscientious. He worked hard, and uh, you could see, see straight away that he, uh, he was going to have a good future in the game. The approach uh, from Millwall it first came about when uh, I met the chairman, Alan Thorne's son, uh, when I was coaching the, the, the youth team at uh, Queen's Park Rangers. I met him a couple of times. Uh, he was quite impressed the way the youth setup was run at Rangers. Uh, I managed to have good long conversations with him, explaining how the youth setup should be run. Uh, and about a year later, when Millwall uh, were actually having a bad time, they were struggling at the bottom of the third division, they sacked the manager and were looking for another one. Uh, funnily enough, uh, I didn't apply for the job. They actually asked me if they could actually interview me. And I always remember uh, meeting Alan Thorne and, uh, at the Hilton Hotel in London. Uh, and Alan asked me my philosophy on the game and how would I, how would I run the club and what would I put right at Millwall. Uh, and after telling them exactly what I would do, we then, then started talking about a contract. And uh, I always remember him offering me £20,000. And uh, quick as a flash, I said, I accept it. And he was actually taken aback and he said to me, uh, why did you accept it so quickly? I said, because if I'm successful, I'm going to be very, very expensive. I'd worked at, at Millwall before with Gordon Jago. And uh, one day George came in and said, um, I'm going to have a go at the Millwall job. And I can't repeat on camera exactly what I replied to that, but it was something like, you must be mad. But anyway, so I don't know what you're complaining about because you're going to come with me. And that's exactly what happened. We ended up signing nine new players and in fact won at Chesterfield of all places by a Dave Cusack penalty by one goal to nil to stay in Division 3. It was quite remarkable. From that very small, humble beginnings, of course, as you know, we won the, got out of the third division, into the second division, and then finished, I believe it was fourth, which is the highest position that Millwall had finished in the last 25 years, in the second division. Uh, I got a quite a surprise one day when Alan Thorne wanted a meeting with me. 
and they explained to me that I'd received a letter from the Arsenal chairman, uh, Mr Hillwood, asking uh, if he can actually approach me with a view of an interview uh, for a job managing the Arsenal team, which actually astounded me because at that time uh, the Arsenal job was being uh, touted around with much more successful managers, Alec Ferguson, Terry Venables, David Pleat, um, Graham Taylor, and I was somewhere down at the bottom of the list uh, with no hopes of uh, getting the job. I never even applied for it. So I went and actually went for the interview with Mr. Hillwood and uh, told him exactly uh, what my philosophy and again on management was. Again, not different from uh, my conversation uh, with, Alan, with Alan Thorne, but the only thing was I didn't have the, the same joke about the, the contract. George has a great feeling for Arsenal Football Club. He, of course, played for the club in the first place, so he was brought up with the traditions and what it means to be an Arsenal man, and there is an Arsenal way of doing things, so he was very conscious of that. And both during his time as a player, and more especially since he became manager, he's looked into the history of the club very deeply. He's collected memorabilia. So he suddenly had to find himself, George Graham, the lad from Baghetti, suddenly alongside the likes of Herbert Chapman and George Allison and Bertie Mee and Tom Whittaker. And I think that sense of history and the fact that he could play a part in the history of this club. I don't have personality clashes with any players. I just pick people on ability. I pick people on uh, performance. And unfortunately, Charlie was not performing. Uh, and actually had a big reputation. And I like stars. Uh, it's about in the media that I, I don't like star footballers, but I do. Uh, I like performing stars. I don't like the so-called stars who are uh, social stars and not doing it on the pitch. Winning the trophy in the first season was an absolute surprise, even to me, because I knew we would still a lot to do. There was a lot of work to be done on the team. But as far as I was concerned, it was a fast bonus uh, because I knew the youngsters were going to get better. And looking back now, that was the, the forerunner for the success we've achieved over the past couple of years and again the basis for what we're going to achieve over the next few years. Once we all uh, report for work, report for training, everybody's treated the same and I vowed then that I would get everybody together uh, and try to achieve this team spirit which is, is so important if you're going to be an outstanding side whether you're winning cups or even more important championships when you're after consistency and I would think that's when you my best achievements over the past three years. I've got a bit of a reputation as a, as a hard man, a very demanding person, which I'll admit to the demanding. Uh, I believe in professional standards, I'm very demanding on professional standards. Uh, I don't get too close to the players being a manager, although I love my coaching, I coach with the players every day. But I don't get too close to them, I keep my distance from them. Uh, because I think it's difficult when you're wielding the, the axe and you may be dropping players or telling them they've no got a future at the club, it's very difficult to socialise with players knowing there will come a time when I've got to uh, be extremely unpleasant or nasty. So certain managers do it certain ways. Uh, I do it this way and I've found it up to now it's, it's quite successful. The manager's got to keep a distance from the players. I mean, uh, he can laugh and joke but he's always got to keep a distance because at the end of the day uh, you know he might have to let you go or, or drop you or whatever and he can't become too friendly uh, and I think that's good um, a manager should keep his distance really it's the coach's job really to be that go-between and uh, uh, have a joke and laugh with the players and, and be the friend be the rear if they need one uh, whereas the manager keeps that little bit of distance hey, you've got all, all managers have got different ideas on the game um, at the end of the day they've got to win and um, it's about getting results. Um, at Arsenal, they say that managers that come to Arsenal are boring. But uh, that's just something that's been going on throughout the years. They had it when Don Al was here, saying that we were a boring team. And even when George Graham came, they said it was boring. But um, we scored the most goals last year, so we can't be that boring. I'll tell you what, Bert, when, when we were together, mm -hmm. and uh, in the late 60s, 68, 69, what mm -hmm. odds then would you have said that George <laughs> Graham was going to be one time the manager of the Arsenal club and they win the league? No chance. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> never like Not hard work. No. I mean, people tell me no. now he's working 24 hours a day. Mm. I never mm. believe it. Mm. I always remember 
we'd start training every morning. And he used to say to me, Don, uh, can we have a fun day today? Which, which he meant, yeah. can we be easy yeah, out today? And, and I used to look at him and say, yeah. George, mm. you know, we got to do it. Yeah. We've got to win on Saturday. And he used to look at me and just mm. get on with it. Right. Well, he must wear two heads because when I see him, he's just the same guy again, you know. And uh, But when he's in the club, obviously, he's, um, he's very disciplined himself. He's always immaculately dressed. He's doing a smashing job here and he's done a good job at Millwall and he's, he's well on his way to be a top manager. When he walked in a room, people seemed to look up to him. He had that presence about him then. And I think that's carried over into his management. When he gets a problem, I'll bet he's first to yes, go on Yes, we are. We have a little, teach, oh. a little lunch and a teaching and full that's marks. Right. I'm delighted to do it and delighted to help yeah. him. But I wouldn't take it on a, on a direct no, no, relationship basis. I'd philosophise on it and he'd then apply it I, to the problem he's got. I tell you what, Bert, I mean, he don't know how old you are or how long you've been in the game. We all need a mentor, don't oh, we? Sure. And it looks to me you from distance as though you're his mentor. Well, uh, yes, I, mean, we I, always, I, I hope so. We always go to yeah. somebody for advice, don't we? Indeed, uh, indeed. We you need got, somebody to talk to and we, a problem with. And we all go to Uncle Bert. Here in the dressing room, actually, is where it all happens on a Saturday. Uh, or a midweek if it's a midweek match. But really the hard work that's being put in really happens in the training ground. It's like being an actor. It's during the week, all the rehearsals on the stage. They work very, very hard, put the work in. And it happens uh, in, on, on the performance on the evening. It's the same as a footballer. All the hard work, as far as I'm concerned, is in the training ground. Here, it's just the performance. OK, just relax a bit more, a little bit stiff. This time, the same again, all right? Let's go. Look straight ahead. Straight ahead. Come on, keep a grip of the ball. Don't look at the ball, Lee. You should know where the ball is. Anton. Look right, Kwame. Good boy. Look left. Just keep touching it, Lee. Well done. Get the old legs. Flex the legs a bit more, Perry. Flex the legs. Well done, David. Well done. And let's go. Outside and inside. Plenty of touches, come on. No, 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 Kwame. Take the ball with you. On, one more, Martin, one more. Go on, Martin, one more. Well done, and pass it in, Martin. Come on, Devo. Okay, you're just knocking it back. All right, and it's not one of them. It's not one of them there. You're just letting your head go back six inches there. Okay, all the time. Couple more. Okay, wait for the Devo. Throw the harder, Devo. That's it, lovely, well done. Okay, and right back into their chest. Right back into their chest. Okay, let's go. Go on. So it makes you a bit more lively. You know, you're very anticipated. <laughs> well done, Brad. And you're standing like that. You're actually standing like that. You know, somebody can actually come round there and actually win the ball off you. So if you get your arms up and be more resilient, more resilient, if somebody's coming in there, you're knocking it back. Oh. The screen in the ball. Okay, let's go. Come on, Connor. During a game, I always sit upstairs in the director's box because uh, I can see a total picture much, much easier when you're up higher. Uh, and at half time, I've got 10 minutes to 15 minutes. If I get any problems, I put them right, especially on from the blackboard here. And sometimes you've got to sort of like G players up with a bit of a talking to. Uh, and other times, you've got to lift players who are maybe going through a bad time. But you know their attitude's good, and you know they need to be lifted. So you've got to be really an amateur uh, psychologist. And uh, hopefully, uh, what you've actually seen in the first half, and what you've actually put over to them at half-time, they will then transfer that onto the field of play. That's when I sit down uh, in the second half with the, my other coach and uh, the physiotherapist. And then, if there's anything is going wrong on the pitch in the second half, then I can put it right, uh, being on the touchline. After the game, then I come in and I say, well done lads, if we've done well, if we've not done well, uh, I more or less tell them. Win or lose, there's always good points to bring out individually, where a player can improve. Don't be satisfied if you've won a game and you've been mediocre. You know, have standards, play to the maximum of your ability individually and collectively. Uh, and if I can get my team playing to as near their capabilities consistently over the season, I would usually be a satisfied person knowing if you do that with talented individuals and a talented team, you should be on the verge of winning things. All that stuff that he, he learned, all the things he took in, he's using them very wisely now. 
I'll say this, I think that, and I wouldn't have to take anything away from him, I think he's been very lucky. He's gone into a fantastic setup. It's all there for him. And here again, don't get me wrong, I'm not patting myself on the back, but I know what he went into. I mean, I was there the two years before he took over, and I, knew what, I know what I had to do to get the club what I thought on the straight and narrow. I think the main thing that he did when he came here was he installed a discipline, directness. People knew what he wanted. People knew what he wanted from them, and if he, he didn't get it, quite simply, he was going to change it. But he didn't change. Everything was exactly the same. Just came in, did what he had to do, and got on with it. At the start of 88-89 season, my expectations really were uh, I'd hope the team would uh, gain more experience, because half my side are still very, very inexperienced. And my new signings, uh, namely Dixon and Bowl from Stoke City, it was their first season in the first division at this level. And also with Winterburn playing his first season, replacing Samson. I was hoping we'd have enough experience to challenge uh, for the championship. And from then up to Christmas, I think we were by far the best team in the division, playing wonderful football. We never ever felt that Liverpool wouldn't be there or thereabouts. But again, the rules remain just the same. George changed the tactics. We decided to play with a sweeper system for a little while. It was effective. We took a lot of stick because people thought it was a defensive way of approaching the job and we would fail miserably again. The, it was really up, it was backs against the wall then. Everybody outside Highbury didn't give us a chance. We then had to go to Anfield and beat them by two clear goals. The week of the game everyone knew we had to go and beat them by two goals to nil and um, everyone was putting everyone under pressure. People were swinging me up saying that do you feel the pressure and, that, and to tell you the truth I've never felt so relaxed for a game. The training sessions were just the same. If anything, the lads mucked about even more in training and um, it was just a relaxed feeling amongst the players and we went up there on the Friday. We had a lunch, had a good lunch, had a good laugh, went to bed for a few hours, Kip, and then uh, the gaffer said before the game, well, um, lads, all you got to do is beat them 2-0. And that's, we looked at each other and we said, yeah, that's all we got to do, might as well go for it. I had a chat with the boys in a Liverpool hotel before the game, told them that uh, we mustn't let them score. Because if they scored one, that meant we'd have to score three and possibly four to beat them. Uh, which I knew was going to be a tremendous uphill struggle. But I also knew that if it was nil-nil at half-time, I'd be satisfied, although I'd prefer it to be one-nil. So although Liverpool, I'm sure, were quite contented at nil-nil at half-time, we could then be released in a second for 45 minutes. You know, really give it everything we've got. I think you've got to be dedicated any managerial job, whether it be Arsenal or Millwall, uh, you've got to be very single-minded. You've got to be want to be successful. You've got to be probably a little bit ruthless. I've really changed. I'd say uh, he's got more ruthless, but um, that's how you've got to be to be a manager. And if you want to win things, you've got to be ruthless sometimes. It's a very selfish job. You're really after your own interests and your family comes second. That's one of the problems. You've got to enjoy your work, and unfortunately things suffer. Uh, your domestic life can suffer. You've got to have a very, very understanding family. But at the end of the day, uh, you've got to go for it. And uh, some things definitely suffer in football life because it is a very unsociable un job, but a very, very rewarding one. When I was a player at Arsenal, I could never envisage managing the club. Uh, but to actually manage them now, uh, won a trophy my first year, won the championship my third year, uh, it's like a fairy tale. Uh, but I think the fairy tale will continue for the next few years because we've laid a wonderful foundation here. The qualities are there that we had in 1971. Um, great team spirit, a lot of discipline, players working for each other, um, unselfishness between the players and not a sort of a star syndrome that some clubs have. And that's what Liverpool have got too. So they're very similar to what we were in 71, and they're very similar to what uh, Liverpool are doing now. I'd just sort of like to welcome all the new trainees uh, at this club. We've always had a great relationship, Brian, with the kids and the first team lads. And it's been good the last three years, and I want that to continue. Very important. It's been a nice little team spirit, family spirit at the club. 
I'm sure the youngsters appreciate it. So make sure we look after them all you pros. Uh, the other thing is fines. Again, let's keep it the same as last season. And uh, anybody who's late for, uh, they'll get one life. Uh, and after that, it's a tenner. You've got the choice. It's either a tenner or ten percent of your wages. Now again, I'll give you, if it's done in that week, I'll give you to the end of the week to pay the tenner. If you don't pay the tenner by the following week, I'll just tell Sheila and she'll just take it out of ten percent out of your wages. Not a tenner, ten percent. Summary of the last season, Nigel. Great, great season, won the championship, tremendous. Unfortunately, we got knocked out in the cups early on, but I'm sure we can put that right this year. The target this year is to do as well. Okay? It's going to be difficult. We're there to be shot at by everybody. But I'll tell you something, if we can sort of like just improve on certain aspects of our game from last season, there's no reason why we can't sort of like be challenging for not only the championships, but for the Cups this season. We're now up there. We're there to be shot at. We're there to be beaten. That's the most difficult one. We've now got to sustain it. I don't want to be known as an overnight success. I want to sort of do it over a period of time. I want more trophies. I'm greedy. I'm demanding. And I'm sure everybody at Arsenal knows that. And I'm sure, although they may not like me, they respect me. And they want to be associated with the success too. Now if you come on down to Highbury, you can see Thierry Henry.